Let's get a welcome and good morning to everybody for our worship service. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, Lord, just thank you for the day you've given. Just thank you for your many blessings on each and every one of us. <coughs> Lord, we just pray you be with our church and just keep us healthy and lead us and guide us, Lord. Do everything done in your name. Jesus, pray. Jesus, I pray. Amen. Let's see. Today is the first day of youth meet. Yay, at 2 30. All youth meet down to church at the uh, fellowship hall at 2 30. Monday be the RBA Association winter meet at Crossroads Baptist Church at 6 30. Tuesday will be men's prayer here at the church at 7. Wednesday night service will be at 7 here in Bible study at the church. Uh, next Sunday, no. And then uh, remember all our shut ins and, and people that are in the rest home. If you could send them a card and stuff, you got the addresses here. And uh, I guess that's it, John. You going to sing happy birthday? <laughs> I mentioned first thing this morning, um, Miss Louise Wright, who is in Wilmington at the nursing home, um, I said I thought she was going to be 90, but I, I found out she's going to be 89, but still that's a big milestone, and I know she would appreciate cards, so anybody who can drop her a card in the mail, she won't know if she gets it on Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday, but anyway, to, um, just let you know, to let her know that you're thinking about it. I know that Richard Hall was just overwhelmed with gratitude for all the cards, I don't know how many people sent them. But he uh, said over and over, and Don said it, you could just tell a big, big difference in his um, demeanor and just his outlook on things because he realizes how much we're praying for him and how much we love him. So Amen. just keep those cards going. Um, keep that bulletin so that you have those addresses uh, near to you all the time. All right, let's go into our worship service, and let's turn to 203. Oh, let's go. I guess we'll sing happy birthday first, to, in case Miss Louise might be tuning in or... Um, or Andy or Novelette. So let's sing happy birthday to them first. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God loves you. Happy birthday to you. Okay, now let's go into our worship service with hymn number 203. We'll stand together and we'll sing both verses. 203. <laughs>
please. And Mr. Randy, he's going to do a focus lesson, so run on down as soon as you can with your mask on. I'm not sorry. It's Caroline. sit through church service and not have a little snack in it. I said, Mom, bring me a little snack in your purse or nothing. No, <laughs> bless your heart. I tell you what, do you want, I, I, Rhonda, pack me a snack for today. Y'all want a little snack? I mean, I got some good stuff here. I got some some, some strained peas. Yep. <laughs> Nobody get excited yet, okay? And I've got squash, you know, baby food squash. Sam might want it, I don't know. And, and, oh, yes, oh, yes, don't even ask me what that is. Look at the color. But, but there it is. You want a snack? No? Nobody wants baby food? No. Okay. <laughs> I've got that question, baby food. Well, is there something wrong with my food? It's baby food, right? Okay. So, you guys don't want to eat baby food, right? Why not? It's a little simple. You don't want baby food because you're not what? Babies. You're not babies anymore. You're all grown up, or at least you think you are sometimes. What's your favorite food? Anybody got pizza? Oh, I got my hand back there. Pizza, hot dogs, french fries, hamburgers. Adult food, right? Okay. We don't need baby food anymore, right? Okay, who likes oysters? Yeah, you like oyster? <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Uh, you like a grilled chicken salad that Mama eats when she's on a diet and puts all that dressing on top of the cheese and all that stuff? That's real adult food, right? So some of you guys might grow into liking oysters one day like Mike and me. Or you might want a grilled chicken salad or greens or Japanese food or whatever. But you don't want any more baby food. And you're not quite ready for adult food. And that's okay. But you know something? Baby food reminds me that when you first became a Christian, when you first become a Christian, the Bible says when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, you're born again. So you're a baby. You're a baby Christian. And everyone knows what babies need. They need baby food. Well, you don't need baby food, but as a Christian, you've got to grow. You are a child. You've got to grow. There's something else that we can learn from the baby food. We have to grow up sometimes. We don't like to, but we have to. I once had a principal you say, everybody needs to put on their big boy britches and grow up. And she was right. Because you don't see your parents sitting down to eat baby food. You don't want to eat baby food. But you got to get there. That's why it's important that you don't start to stop learning about Jesus after you've accepted him as your Savior. You need to study the Bible. You need to spend some time every day in your Bible. That's what you need to do to grow. You need to get through that baby food stage. You need to spend some time in prayer. If we had it, we'd be in Sunday school. But we got children's uh, church right now, and we'll have youth this afternoon. You need to be there because we're going to talk about the Bible. We're going to talk about spiritual growth. You need to grow so you can grow up and be strong in the Lord. You need real food. You need the Bible. You need to work at it, and that helps you grow. I want to challenge you guys. Don't get stuck in the baby food stage. And it's so easy. There's lots of Christians. And you hear pastor talk about it all the time. You know, you can ask somebody, you know, how about you walk with the Lord? They're in their 60s. They're going, oh, what's a walk with the Lord? I'm a Christian. Well, what, what have you learned after being a Christian? I don't know. I just thought I was supposed to be a Christian. you got to grow. But the Bible promises that you know, will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is, the Christ. And if you want to know where that is, that's Ephesians chapter 4, verses 14 and 15. We've got to grow. And how we're going to grow? 
study and work and pray. Right? Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for these young people. We just continue to lift them up, those that are with us now and those that are at home today watching this on TV or on their internet. We just pray that you would help them grow and get past that baby food stage, that they can be workers in the church, that can be workers in uh, your kingdom. For it's in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. No baby food? We'll go back to mama today. Okay. That's Randy's one. I want the fruit stuff. That's a good stuff. Okay, um, Callie is going to play for me this morning, and we're going to do one we did a few weeks, months ago. Um, she is doing an awesome job playing, and y'all just keep lifting her up because she's a blessing to uh, to help us out with music as well as Miss May, and we just appreciate her, appreciate her so much. Also, um, during this time, I would love, love, love for somebody to step up and say, hey, I want to do a special. I would love for you to do that. Um, so if you want to, to sing a special, you want to play, you want to just... Um, Whatever you want to do is something special that would um, be part of our worship service. We welcome that. So we're well, going to do a song called Here I Am to Worship. <clears throat> Bible, First John. Yeah, can I make one quick? Um, yeah, might get announcements. The men are going to meet Tuesday night, but also the women. So, women, if you'll come with your men Tuesday night, or come with yourself, or whatever. But we're going to have a WMU meeting at seven on Tuesday night as well. In the family life. Everybody hear that? WMU meeting. Seven o'clock Tuesday night. Men, if you don't uh, know by now, we are uh, we meet on Tuesday nights at seven o'clock to pray. Uh, we focus on three things: uh, that's our church, our community, and our country. And uh, by the looks of things, all by the looks of things, all three of those need some seriously deep prayer. Uh, so if you have your Bibles, uh, First John. <coughs> Verse 
1 John, and we're going to start in verse 1 there. Uh, of course, this letter that we are looking at today um, was written by what would have believed to be the same John that uh, wrote the gospel, uh, many of the same Greek and the same style, the literary function. Uh, so we believe it to be the same John. So 1 John chapter 1 he starts out by saying, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concern, concerning the word of life. The life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that the eternal life which was in the, with the Father and was manifested to us, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And that these things we write unto you, that your joy may be full. And so let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for this day. I thank you for uh, uh, each one that's gathered here, Lord. I thank you for uh, a good first service, Lord. We look forward to the second service, and we pray that you just show up in a mighty way, Father. Lord, I pray you... Uh, uh, be with the reading of your word. Be with the preaching of your word. I pray that you let any idle words fall to the ground, Lord, and preach me like a dying man to dying people, for that is all that I am and all that I ever will be. And, Father, that your name be glorified and lifted above all names. And we ask these saints in your name. Amen and amen. Uh, what I want to look at this morning is John is testifying to the truth of Jesus. There is a relationship that is to be had. And so John is testifying and he's giving this first portion uh, to help you understand uh, that he's not just a hearsay, that he's not just somebody who has heard this in passing. Uh, I used a different illustration this morning. I used uh, Brother Mike, but I want to kind of use a, maybe a little bit more of an illustration this service to maybe kind of drive it home a little bit. I've been kind of looking and I was like, well, a lot of people just thought that was more fun, fun and funny than it was uh, what I was trying to go at. But um, imagine if any of y'all have ever found yourself in a court. Have you, has anybody ever been in court? You don't have to say what for. Have you ever been in a courtroom? Have you ever been in a, um, what do they call it, a judicial proceeding where they have the uh, jury come up and they have the witnesses take the stands? And you know, Have you ever seen that? Sneak into the courthouse sometime. They'll, they'll let you come in. It's really interesting to watch how our system is set up. And so what happens is they call somebody to the stand. And let's say we're going to call uh, Mike to the stand for what he saw last night. And he begins to testify about what he saw. Now, I don't know what Mike saw, but I can tell you one thing. If Mike saw with his eyes, then he is an eyewitness. Now, what's the difference in an eyewitness and a I, I heard somebody say? It holds more value. It holds more, uh, the word, uh, let's pull one in college words, it holds more validity to it. I've got to pull one of them out every once in a while to make that college education work. But it holds more weight with it. When somebody says, I was there, I saw with my own eyes. Now I used the story this morning that uh, Mike had stopped on the side of the road and this man was changing his tire and Randy was in the car with him and the car fell on him. And so Mike went over there with one hand and picked up the car and with the other hand pulled the man out. Now, Mike come back into church and he told this story. Now, some of y'all might say, well, it's obviously true because he was there. Now, let's say Randy told Bo. And then Bo come into the church and told us that same story. You see the difference in how we would kind of begin to think? Brother? <laughs> I think you've been sipping on that. I think, I think your juice is full while you've gone. <laughs> <laughs> But we wouldn't believe it as much as if we saw Mike walk in the door and say, I was there, I saw it. So this is what John is doing. John is saying, number one, he's starting off, that which was from the beginning. John is not giving you some new revelation. John is saying, that which was from the beginning. He's saying that truth never changes. 
The truth is still the same. If the truth is this way today, it'll be the same way tomorrow. It'll be the day after and the day after. And so that is one of the biggest things that is under attack today is the truth. Uh, it's so hard to look at somebody, especially some of these uh, crybaby liberals, and say there is absolute truth. Oh, it kills them to think that there is an absolute truth. Why? That means that there has got to be a moral compass about someone if they believe in absolute truth. Now, if you believe in that relativism mess that, well, Bo's truth is different from my truth, but both of our truths are true because, you know, he believes it. Listen, there is an absolute truth and that's it. And so John is saying that there is no change in the truth. It's the same from the beginning. He says that which was from the beginning so he's, he's giving you the, the, the point of reference to say that even in Genesis, all the way to Revelation, nothing has changed. Truth remains the same. He says, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, we've looked upon with our hands and handled concerning the word of life. Listen, John is saying, I'm not here to deliver some hearsay. I'm not, delivered, I'm not here to give you some tradition that I've heard. I'm not here to give you a story that I heard from so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so. And so. John is saying, I have seen with my eyes. I have heard with my ears. I have handled with my hands. And I have studied this thing that he's getting ready to talk about. And so he's saying, this is what my eyewitness statement of what is getting ready to happen. So John says, uh, he's giving you that, uh, handling or handled with our hands concerning the word of life. Now, that same word, logos, in the Greek, there's another college word there. I'm making, I'm making money today. Uh, getting them $10 words out. But logos, meaning the, the, the word or, or the truth. And so we see that same exact rendering over in John the Gospel of John chapter 1, he says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and in the beginning with God. Why is that important? Well, John's already told you the truth has been the same since the beginning. Amen. Now John is saying that Jesus has been existent since the beginning. Amen. And so Jesus, the Son, God the Father, have been existent since the beginning. Now, why is that important? Why is that even, why does he even make that claim? Well, because number one, there's two reasons that John is writing this letter. The first reason is that he is writing a pastoral letter to read to his flock and hopefully encourage them, edify them, and, and build them up and prepare them for the heresies that are beginning to come into the church. Uh, and what he's trying to do is he's trying to combat those heresies, and so he's, he's preparing them for that. And so what was going on in that day and time was a lot of what was called uh, uh, Gnosticism, and they would come in and they would say, you know, well, you know, we, we can't really believe that God put, took on flesh because flesh is bad. So they believed in some pseudo-physical phantom of Jesus. He never actually was in the flesh. Why is that a problem, preacher? Why can't we just all get along and believe that? Why can't we just believe, you know, those minor things? Well, let me explain why that's a problem. If Jesus never came and actually become flesh and was fully God, then even though he may have been tested and tempted in all the ways, if he was never flesh, then he never really experienced what I experienced. So then that what? What does that do? That it takes my plane above his, and that puts him down here. That's why I want you to be careful when you're talking to your Jehovah's Witness friends. Because Jesus is here, and they are here, they put Jesus down here. They put God here, but Jesus is down here. Jesus isn't God. But here's the problem. John is saying, but I have seen, I have heard with my eyes, and the word that we tell you has been existent since the beginning. And so now we have, this, we have this place that we can look at. We can see that God the Son, God the Father have always existed since the beginning. And so he's, he's battling this off. The second reason that he wrote this was for polemical reasons or apologetical reasons to defend the truth. And so he knew that they were coming in. So why did he find it important? Because listen, these same things and same stuff is going on in churches today. They are falling by the wayside. And I, I saw a little thing. If, if you don't, if a 
Christian doesn't understand doctrine and they don't understand theology and they don't read their Bible, how in the world will they ever be able to spot a false prophet? And I find that being one of the biggest problems in our churches today, even, even in America. I know we think that we're some kind of special or something, but listen, there are many preachers who stand by the high of the pulpit and preach a gospel that does not exist or is false. Uh, I'm not going to get into any name calling today or anything such as that because y'all know I'm better than that. But, uh, it, but he's saying that there are people who are going to come and teach you different things. Not just the Gnostics, but even in the Judaizers. The Judaizers would come along and it, listen, the Judaizers still exist. I want you to understand that. Uh, some of them exist in the Baptist churches. But they come along and they say, man, I'm sure glad you got saved. But now that you're saved, you know, you also need to do this and this and this and this. You know, or, or you know, people might start that. Listen, I'm going to tell you how to be saved. The Bible gives real clear instructions on how to be saved. It says repent and believe. It says nothing about sign a card. It says nothing about you got to join this kind of church and that kind of church. It says repent and believe. It ain't got nothing to do with a little prayer. I'm going to tell you something. You'll never find that little prayer anywhere in the New Testament. You'll never hear any of Paul, James, John, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. You'll never hear any of them say, now let me tell you something. If you want to come down here and you want to avoid hell, then come down here and repeat this prayer after me. Listen, they all said the same thing. They said, repent and believe. Repent and believe. And you got to believe in what? Believe in the Son of God. And that is Jesus Christ and that is who we're talking about. Don't you just love how the Bible just keeps coming back around to itself? All right. Amen, preacher. Preach. I'm trying. All right. Here we go. We're going into the word of life. And I want you to understand that John is giving this testimony from an eyewitness. Why is that important? Because the truth is under attack so bad this day, this day and time. I, I, I love just studying and listening to some of the liberal theology and some of these things. Why, preacher? Because I want to know what most of Americans are believing. I, I talked today about a little bit about how people have this idea that, uh, you know, as long as somebody has a big enough name and, and they're, they're uh, uh, renowned by the world enough, then surely what they say is true. And I want to tell you that is false. That is false. Listen, if you don't get in God's word and you don't have your heart prepared, you will never find and see a false prophet. I'm telling you. Now, they're coming to end time. I believe that we are in the end times. I know we've heard that all of our life. Lord have mercy. If I've heard one preacher preach it, I've heard a thousand preachers preach it. Brother, we're in the last days. This, that, and the other. But I'm telling you, now we've been closer than we've ever been to, to the Lord's return. And I believe his return is imminent. I believe it's close. And I believe that we've got people out here in this world who have this idea. They have a whole bunch of religion. They have a whole religiosity. They have a whole lot of, uh, me and uh, Philip was talking about the other day, a lot of people have this family tie idea. Well, my family's down there. They're, they're a part of Shady Grove Baptist Church, so obviously I'm going to heaven because uh, so-and-so's a deacon, and so you know, if my daddy's a deacon, surely I'm going to heaven, right? Or, or you know, my daddy's a preacher, surely I'm going to heaven, right? Or, or you know, I, I'm good friends with Don, so obviously I'm going to heaven, right? Hey, listen, we have people who really believe this. They believe because they've been baptized, they're on their way to the promised land. They believe because they've signed a card, they're on their way to the promised land. They believe because they said a little prayer after what the preacher said. And that, that, then they're good to go. Listen, if you haven't put your relationship and faith in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone, what you have is a big, fat dose of religion. Amen? Amen. <coughs> All right. Now, let's get started on the sermon. <laughs> what's, what's funny is y'all think I'm kidding. Uh, that, was my, <laughs> that was my introduction. Uh, verse 3, what do we have in verse 3? That which you have seen, we have heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship. He is saying that there is a, there is a relationship to be had. There is a relationship to, to have, have, have with this word of life, with this logos. And the purpose of John's declaration about this eternal, existent, physically present word of life who is God, yet in person distinct from the Father, is to bring his readers into fellowship with both God's people and God himself. Now, I want you to understand something. I know a lot of people get kind of anxious and squirmy when I say this, especially you folks on Facebook. I love you. 
But y'all get squirmy when I start talking about this. Listen, I think it is one of the biggest lies that the devil has sold, folks, that they say, I, I hear it all the time. Well, preacher, I don't have to go into that church to be a Christian. I don't have to be around all those people to be a Christian. I don't have to do this to be a Christian. You know what? You're absolutely right. But if you're Christian, you're going to want to be around Christians. <laughs> Lord have mercy. I'm going to tell you what, a lot of people have this idea that, man, hey, I got my ticket. I can sit at home and just pretend like the whole world doesn't exist. Let me tell you something. When God truly re regenerates your heart and changes your heart and gives you new desires, you're going to start seeing just how close your wretched heart was to hell and realize that other people are just as close to hell and you're going to want to see them come to Christ. You're not going to want to say, hey, I got my ticket. I'm going to sit at home and do nothing at all about it. There's a world that is diving off into hell while we we sit comfortable in our homes and say, hey, you know, I, I know I'm saved, preacher. Praise God, I know I'm saved. How dare us sit on our high horses and say, oh, I'm going to sit over here. I've got my ticket to heaven. I'm good to go. I've got my four-piece suit that I'm going to be buried in. And when I see the Lord, I'm going to do this. Let me tell you something. A lot of us, when we see the Lord, we're going to put our heads down and we ain't going to be able to say a word because he's going to say, I gave you opportunity after opportunity to witness to a lost and dying world and you sit at home and done nothing. It gets tough up here sometimes. I'm going to tell you what. But the relationship. There's an invitation to have a relationship. What does that idea of relationship mean? The koinia. The fellowship. Many of you all may be coming into a relationship with Christ by having a relationship. See, John's saying we want you to have fellowship with us. But he said, really, I want you to have fellowship with him. Now, I had a great practical example to make that. How many of y'all got saved in a church service? How many of y'all got saved in vacation Bible school? I ain't doing that for a church priest in vacation Bible No, I'm just kidding. How many of y'all got saved at a revival? How many of y'all got saved at a, a, a campus uh, thing where they come, what they call Campus, campus crusade. crusade. How many of y'all got saved at an event that a church was doing? How did that happen? Because John said, I want you to have fellowship with us so that you can have fellowship with the Father. Many of us came into a fellowship with God through fellowship with God's people. How important is it for us to have fellowship with those and invite them? Listen, John is saying it is very important for you to have a fellowship so that you can bring them in so that they can have fellowship with God. That's why it's important. That's why it's important. There's a result to that relationship. He says in verse 4, he says, These things I write unto you that your joy may be full. I read this this morning. The result of fellowship is fullness of joy. This joy is an abiding sense of optimism and cheerfulness based on God. Your happiness is a sense of optimism and cheerfulness based on circumstances. Your circumstances will change, but God doesn't. Now, I'm not going to sit up here and say I'm a smiley guy. Some days I wake up and, man, it is the wrong side of the bed, wrong side of the room, wrong side of the house, wrong side of the street. It's just a bad day. That don't mean I'm not saved. That means my circumstances are depending on, or my happiness is depending on my circumstances. But deep down, my joy is in the Lord. Man. Because he never changes. He never changes. We have truth and we can take comfort in that. Spurgeon said this. He says, if any of you have lost the joy of the Lord, I'm not talking about any happiness. If any of you have lost the joy of the Lord, I pray that you do not think it a small loss. I pray that you don't think it's a small loss. And we should be happy in the Lord. Listen, there's a lot of things going on these days. I was just telling John a little while ago, I said, you know, one of the things, I think it's kind of the unknown of everything. You know, what if, what if I, what, what, what if I, what if I get this, or what if I have a heart attack going down the road and I die? What if I have a stroke and boom, I'm gone? Now see, if your hope is this side, then these times are probably really, really depressing. But see, my hope is not on this side. My hope's on the other side. 
I might get killed in a car wreck. I might just die of natural causes. I might get, but hey, listen, my hope and joy is in the Lord. My hope and joy is on the other side because listen, this side of glory, there's a lot of bad things that can happen. I can get, I can get my back ache. I can get heartache. I can get this, that, and the other. But there's coming a day, Don, where that's not going to affect me anymore. I'm going to step out of this body and step into a glorified body. And there's not going to be no waking up and having to warm up like an old mobile. I'm going to get up and I'm going to feel good. I'm going to jump around and praise God. Why? Because I'm in His presence. I don't have to worry about all the things of the world. I don't have to worry about what CNN said. I don't have to worry about the things of the world. All I have to do is just worship Him. Hey, you know one thing I just got to thinking about? One of the things that, you know, a lot of people say, man, I just, I just don't know about, you know, some Somebody told me about a Lifeway thing about a guy putting out and said uh, a lot of these churches are, are preferring that their pastors. I hope y'all didn't fill this form out because you did. You need to get down here and repent. Uh, but they filled out these things and they said, listen, we want a pastor that can come in and preach a 15-minute sermon. We don't like these long sermons and we don't like these long worship services. We want to get our 15 minutes and get our juice and get out the door. We don't want these long things. Listen, I want you to understand when you're in heaven, you're going to be worshiping God. You're going to be standing in awe of him. You're going to be praising his name. There ain't going to be no, hey, I'm going to take a bite. I'm going to go and get my 15 minutes of the Lord and then go home. Listen, that's all we're going to do is praise him and be in his and be in his, and just in his presence. And man, it's like pulling teeth to get folks to worship God. Amen. I'm talking about Christians. They say, well, preacher, I just want 15 minutes. I'm done. I don't think you're going to like heaven really good. We might edit that one out of the video. <laughs> I don't think you're going to like heaven real good. Let me recap the four verses and then we'll get home and get to see something Friday. Oh my goodness, what in the world have I done? I'm sending y'all home too early. Let me recap the four verses. John began with the beginning, the eternal God who was before all things. God and his son were always there. Colossians give that, that same thing. They redo the same thing, battling against Gnosticism, against modalism, against all these things that were trying to be brought into the church. He told us that God was physically manifested. He said, I've seen him, i heard him, I've touched him. And so, by the way, a pseudo-phantom you can't touch. Um... He told us that God was the word of life, the Logos. Uh, he told us that God is distinct from the person of God the Father. He told us that we have fellowship with God and we're often introduced into fellowship with God by fellowship with God's people. He told us that the eternally existent God, the word of life, who was physically present with the disciples and others and present for fellowship is God the Son named Jesus Christ. By the way, whenever you submit yourself to God and he comes into your heart, that is a relationship that nobody can take away from you. And by the way, you can hurt that relationship. Just like I've talked about the relationship with my wife. If I say I'm married to my wife and I love my wife and I wink at my wife and I tell her how, how awesome she is and I buy her little gifts here and there and maybe I come home early and say, hello, sweetie, I'm going to take care of the kids. You go to the mall and and take somebody else's credit card and, and you know, I come home and I dote on her boat, you know, I just come home and just do all kinds that relationship's gonna be good, isn't it? But if I come home and I ignore her everything she says, I just like whatever, whatever. I'm I'm going in here, I, I don't want anything. And if I abuse that and I don't take care of that relationship and I ignore her and I don't pour into her, that relationship's not gonna be good. And, and that's a problem a lot of times you see in, in our, our Christian walk. And some of my worst weeks have been weeks where I forgot my first love. There have been weeks where I've been just I've become so busy that I forgot to give God time. And so we need to pour into that relationship. I'm going to make a bold statement that these first four verses, you can live the rest of your Christian life on. Why? Because it's the truth. It's the truth that God is who he says he is. Many look at the relationship as a get out of jail free card. I've been to, the, been to the jail a few times and, and you go in and I don't know what it is, but it's like they go from mingering rattlesnakes to when they get put in jail, they're like, preacher, I've, I've always been a Christian. I've always been a Christian. I've always known to do right. 
I'm not picking on them. I'm just saying they pull out the Jesus card when trouble comes. See, Jesus, whenever he said submit, repent and believe, and you submit your life over to him, he didn't want a rental contract. He wanted you to sign the deed over. He wanted you to sign the deed to your life over. A lot of people have this idea. I wrote this down as a quote from Washer. A lot of people have this idea that Christianity is all about doing the right things that you hate and avoiding all the wicked things that you love just in order to go to heaven. Yes, I said that correctly. We have this idea that Christianity is doing the things, doing all the right things that you hate doing and avoiding all the wicked things that you love doing in order to go to heaven. This is nothing more than a lost person with religion. A Christian is one whose heart has been changed and their affections are made new. I'm not talking about you become perfect. And we're going to get to a verse here in this John where he says you can't keep sinning and be a Christian. He's saying you don't want to stay in that state of sin. If you know something's a sin, you're not going to want to stay in that sin and continue sinning. Doesn't mean you're going to wake up one day and you're going to be perfect. It means we ought not want to keep sinning. That God should convict us and show us and say, you know, hey, the way you're living is wrong. And so I ask today, do you have those new affections? Do you have those new affections? Is that relationship true? Listen. I'm going to give you the gospel because I believe if a man stands up here and doesn't give the gospel, he ought to shut up and sit down. The gospel is this. Jesus Christ came by a virgin, was born fully God, fully man. Can't go any further than that. I'm not no scholar. I just believe it because John said it. And he's an eyewitness, so I'm going to take his word for it. Amen. Fully God, fully man. Live this world, in this world, was tempted all my ways, tempted all the ways you've been tempted, tempted to sin, tempted to fail, tempted to do all these things, but yet remained sinless. Why is that important? Because if he had sinned, he'd have been just as fallible as me. But he didn't. He should remain perfect. And that, there's also a good little teaching now that they say Jesus was murdered. I'm going to tell you, Jesus wasn't murdered. Jesus said, I lay down my life and I take it back up. So Jesus laid down his life. Not because you were a scholar or because you deserved it, because on your own, you're not going to make it. And so he laid down his life. And then with that, that sacrifice, that perfect sacrifice, you're able to come into a relationship with God. Before, we had to go in and, and, you know, do the turtle doves and do this and do that and all these other things. And, and God came in and sent his son and the veil was torn so that now we have a relationship with God. We don't have to go through the priest. We have a relationship with God. So with that relationship, he says to repent and believe. And with that repentance and believing, that means we submit our life to him. Not give a part of it. Not give up on Sundays. But we give our whole lives to live in however he wants us to live. He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. And all these other things will be added unto you. I want you to understand, there's a lot of ideas about what salvation is and what this, that, and the other. Salvation is being saved from God. Some of y'all just woke up. Did the preacher just say saved from God? Let me explain. The penalty for sin is God's wrath. You realize that? That's what was poured out on Jesus whenever he laid down on the cross was God's wrath. That's why Jesus was, was sweating and, 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 and crying and had great drops of blood. It wasn't because of the Roman soldiers. It wasn't because of the scourging. It wasn't because of all the things they were going to do to him. It was because he knew his father's wrath was about to come down on him. 
in my place and your place and our place. Jesus knew the wrath of God was about to come down on him. Now, why is that important? Because if we repent and believe in Jesus, because it, that statement, I am the way, the truth, the life, no man comes to the Father but by me, if that's true, then it's through Jesus and Jesus Christ alone. Then if we accept that, his wrath was poured out on his son in my place. If not, I want you to understand something. If not, and that's, this includes our Jehovah's Witness brothers and all of a sudden, all these people that deny who Jesus Christ is, when judgment day comes, and judgment day will come, the wrath of God will be poured out on them. Yeah. So it doesn't matter whether you want to believe in him or, or, or well, that, that preacher, this, that, and the other. The, the Bible says one day every knee shall bow and shall yeah. confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of yeah. all. He didn't say just if you feel like it, or just if you believe, or just if you're in a Christian world. He says every knee. That's why it's important to have the truth. Because we are equipped with the truth and there is a lost and dying world out there that needs to hear it. You have a neighbor that needs to hear it. You have a son and daughter, a, a, a nephew, a, a niece that needs to hear it. And it's our job to go out and tell them. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for this day. I thank you for loving us and keeping us. <sighs> Father, I know sometimes, sometimes our sermons in steam. Sometimes our sermons are great and they're exciting. Father, sometimes they're sober when we realize that there's a lost and dying world out there. And so, Father, I pray that you just help us to remember that it's our place to be there for those. And so, Father, I pray that there, if there be one here today, Lord, that don't have that relationship, that they know Without that relationship, the wrath of God is pointed upon them. And Father, it's not about jumping through hoops. It's not about signing a card. It's about repenting and believing on the name of Jesus Christ. That's easy. That's simple. That's all it is, Lord. But Father, I fear that many of us have missed that. Father, I thank you and I love you. I ask these things in your precious and holy name. She's going to come and... Uh...